Hey guys, welcome to this practical review of Blackmagic's Ursa Mini 4K cinema camera. No, this is not for the 4.6K version. Now, if you missed my unboxing of this camera, you can see it here. Now, first, a disclaimer. This is my first camera review. I haven't studied color science or camera mechanics, and I'm not a DP by trade. So, don't expect super technical analysis. Just think of this like an informal chat with a friend who loves to nerd out on cameras. I'm gonna hit you with the TLDR first. I think the Ursa Mini 4K provides a solid bang for your buck and I'm happy with my purchase, but it has plenty of issues and drawbacks. It needs lots of light, fast lenses, external audio sources, and it badly needs a firmware update from Blackmagic to address its issues. They say that's coming soon. They don't say shit, we're all assuming that actually. I'm a big fan of this camera's image quality, dynamic range, bit depth, high frame rates, user-friendly time-lapse, form factor and shoulder mount, EVF and ProRes workflow. However, I've been frustrated with the low native ISO, lack of higher ISOs, fixed pattern noise, overall noise at ISO 800, and annoying glitches. If you understand and are okay with the limitations of this camera, I think you can get great results and be happy. In my opinion, it's incredibly powerful for its price, especially compared to competing cameras like Sony's FS5, FS7, A7, S2, or Canon C100, C300, or 5D Mark III. More importantly, everything I've read about and the footage I've seen coming off of the Ursa Mini 4.6K version lead me to believe it will be a significant step above this camera. Over the years, I've used a variety of video cameras in the prosumer and low-end professional range. The main thing I've learned, different tools for different jobs and different budgets. When it comes to buying your own camera though, I think many of us are looking for the silver bullet, a camera that strikes the perfect balance between image quality, functionality, versatility, workflow, and perhaps most important, price. When I first read about the Ursa Mini, I thought it really had a chance to be that silver bullet. I've now shot with it in a variety of situations and I have some reactions. My most recent camera was the Blackmagic Production camera 4K. It served me very well for its price and it's my main point of comparison for this review. Now it's worth mentioning that the majority of my footage was shot in 4K ProRes 422 LT. I found that ProRes LT is the practical middle ground between retaining quality and keeping file sizes more reasonable. Obviously you'll get higher quality with ProRes 422, 422HQ, 444, 444XQ, raw 3 to 1 or uncompressed raw. But the file sizes especially in 4K become enormous. And another thing, all this footage of me talking against white is shot on the Ursa Mini 4K in ProRes LT with a shotgun mic via XLR. So consider it sample footage and audio. All this camera body footage is not sample footage. It was shot on a Canon 7D. The first section I have in this review is image quality. As far as I can tell, the sensor is the biggest factor here and reports are that the Ursa Mini 4K has the same sensor as the production camera. I loved the images coming off the production camera and so far I love the images coming off the Ursa Mini 4K. Now I've used the Ursa Mini 4K outdoor in direct sunlight, in shade, and pointed directly at the sun. I've shot indoor with practical lights, CFLs, and LEDs. I've shot against a white psych and I've shot against a couple different green screens. In all cases, when I've had enough light and shot at ISO 400, I've been happy with the image quality. The global shutter on this camera is easy to take for granted, but it's a big reason I prefer it over other cameras. It's particularly helpful with fast motion where a rolling shutter results in distortion and jello-y footage, as can happen on the Sony a7S II and to a lesser extent the FS5 and FS7. I've actually had one project where I successfully reshot a close-up of a spinning contraption with the production camera because vertical lines had been initially distorted by the Alexa's rolling shutter. So that's replacing a shot from an Ari Alexa with a shot from the Blackmagic production camera. Having 10-bit 422 depth and 12-bit RAW at 4K internally also seems like a huge win compared to 8-bit 420 on the FS5 and the A7S II. Let's take a look at some sample footage.
also been impressed with the lack of moiré and tight patterns compared to Canon and Sony cameras I've used. It's not perfect though. Look at the bullshit in this fine texture dress shirt. I always felt like Canon footage was a bit orange and Sony footage was a bit magenta and that neither company has really nailed skin tones. I've been happier with skin tones in Blackmagic footage, but it always seems a bit greenish. So I almost always adjust the tint toward magenta in Premiere's Lumetri plugin. On that note, it's also worth mentioning that I always shoot in film mode. This is basically a flat color profile. And then I apply the same LUT every time, more or less, which is from a guy named Captain Hook. It's called the Film to Video Basic V1 LUT. I'll put a link to it in the description below. Now, just as I was finishing up writing this review, I came across an article that discusses the issue of IR pollution or infrared pollution. I'd heard about it in the past, but I didn't understand it and didn't take the time to learn more. Now I get it. You may have noticed some of my outdoor footage seems a little magenta. It's most noticeable when shooting outdoors with strong ND filters, and it's really hard to fix with color correction. I'll talk more about ND filters in the functionality section, but for now you should know one thing. You really should have both ND filters and UV IR cut filters on your lenses with the Ursa Mini when filming outside. Here's a quick demo of how increasing ND adds IR pollution and how an IR cut filter can counteract that pollution. It's subtle in the first shots where the ND is minimal and the aperture is more closed, but it's very noticeable as ND increases and the aperture becomes more open. Big picture, you should notice an improvement in the range of colors in your shots with the UV IR cut filter. For me, the most exciting two features of the Ursa Mini are the new form factor and the higher frame rates. More on frame rates later. As much as Blackmagic has touted the revolutionary, compact size of the cinema camera and the production camera, the shape has always been very awkward. To be usable, these cameras must have an external power source, whether that's a giant battery or an auxiliary power cord. And rigging that to the camera is a challenge. They also badly need an XLR to quarter inch audio adapter, such as the A-Box, and some sort of rig. That could be a top hand, a cage or a giant shoulder mount rig, which I think is really impractical these days. Now the Ursa Mini's ENG style form factor, shoulder mount kit, and EVF solved all of this. The battery mounts right on the back, shotgun mic and lav receiver can mount easily on top, cables are accessible, and there's a convenient top handle. You can balance the whole rig on your shoulder with one arm and have a truly free hand for the lens, menu adjustments, or checking your phone. I've shot handheld for hours at a time with this rig and I have not been cramped and in pain at the end, though my arm does get tired. One surprise was that this camera, while marketed as a very lightweight five pound camera for just the body, is actually about 14 pounds when I've outfitted it with a battery, shoulder mount, base plate, microphones, etc. That's not really heavy, but it's also not that light. Now note, in order to easily switch between shoulder mount and tripod, you do need a specific quick release base plate. The one I got that has worked beautifully so far is the Sony VCT14. It's not cheap, but I'll put a link to it below. Let's talk about frame rates. You get 60 frames per second in all HD and UHD flavors, including RAW, and up to 120 frames per second in HD, though it is a windowed sensor. In the limited testing I've done, the results of these modes look fantastic, except at ISO 800. More on that later. It's worth noting that the 1080p sensor crop for 120 frames per second means your focal length is instantly magnified, which often means you either need to move back the camera from your subject or switch to a wider lens to get your shot. The only issues I see with slow-mo are related, light sensitivity and noise. As you increase frame rates, the camera needs more light. On a camera with relatively low ISOs, 200, 400, and 800, you quickly become very limited by available light. One of my favorite features of Blackmagic cameras is the variety of native ProRes flavors and internal RAW recording. The one caveat here is that all the flavors of ProRes, especially at 4K, make for very large file sizes. If you're capturing a really large amount of footage, maybe unscripted, documentary, or events, these file sizes could hinder your workflow or incur significant storage costs. All right, the next thing, ND filters. This has been discussed by everyone online already, but it's one of the biggest shortcomings of this camera. There are no built-in ND filters. For those who don't know, neutral density or ND, whether built into the camera as a glass filter that screws onto the end of a lens or in plastic sheets taped to a window, reduces the intensity of light entering the camera. Not having ND most often results in the following. You're excited to shoot some beautiful shallow depth of field footage outside. You open up the aperture on your fast lens, but everything's blown out. So you crank the shutter speed to something like 1 over 500 to get your exposure right. The shot appears to look great, but the second anything in the frame moves or the 
second you move the camera, you've got unintentional, super sharp and intense war movie style footage. Not a good look for most interviews and B-roll. ND allows you to cut down the light so that you can open up your lens and still have a reasonable shutter speed and realistic looking motion. This is most often somewhere between 1 over 50 or 1 over 100. Now menus on the camera. Other reviews have gone way in depth on menus so I'll just speak to a few items. First white balance. I'm fine with 18 increments from 2800K to 8000K. Shutter angle. I wish that you could switch between shutter angle and shutter speed. Sure, I could teach myself how to convert these, but I learned on speed first so it's hard to convert it in my head. Now audio options. I do have an audio section, but in terms of menus, I wish you could set options for the two XLR channels independently. It'd be great to be able to use XLR input one for a shotgun or a lav mic and still get a scratch audio track from the onboard mic. Right now, it's either all onboard mic or all XLR inputs. Similarly, I wish you could set the input level, aka the preamp, for each channel independently. For example, you might want to use mic low for your shotgun and mic high for your lav source. Now, I'm not talking about the amount of input, obviously. You can still set that on each channel independently from 0 to 100. But they should probably change the name of input levels to something like amplification because the menus right now are confusing. Now, just a bit on resolution and sensor. They should probably remove the choice of sensor mode, full or windowed, and just have an update based on the resolution and the frame rates you choose. The current layout is a bit confusing and cumbersome. Lastly, time lapse. This is one of my favorite features of Blackmagic cameras, and it hasn't really been updated in a while, but it's super simple simple and user friendly and you can get ready to edit time lapses straight off the camera without wasting time and disk space. A bit about the EF mount, like many people I love the bang for your buck that you get from Canon lenses so having EF mount on the Blackmagic cameras is great. That said, I can't speak much to the communication between camera and lens as I always shoot manual. The few times I've tried autofocus, it took several seconds before it focused, which didn't seem that good. And like all Blackmagic cameras, you can control the aperture on a lens without an aperture ring with the rewind and fast forward buttons on the camera. I've also been lucky enough to sometimes get access to some glorious Leica R lenses. The combination of this higher end glass with the Ursa Mini has produced some great footage. For anyone who's curious, I found a guy online who makes Leica R to Canon EF adapters that are 10 times better than any other adapters I've seen. His company is called Litax. I'll put a link in the description below. These adapters screw into the existing bayonet of your lens, making them semi-permanent, but rock solid. I've used $15 R to EF adapters as well as Metabones adapters, and there's always some jiggle there. Okay, a section I'm sure many people are wondering about, glitches. Now, there are some things I hate about Blackmagic. They're absolutely the worst company at delivering products on schedule, and sometimes they're products suffer from defects and glitches. That said, there are some things I love about Blackmagic. They're a younger, smaller, disruptive company that offers powerful products at unbeatable prices without unnecessary bullshit like codec wrappers and proprietary media. And they provide relatively frequent updates to their product firmware to address issues. So, while there are some issues with the Ursa Mini, I'm confident they will improve the firmware in this camera and add functionality just as they did with all the cameras prior. Now I've seen a bunch of glitches reported online, but I can only speak to the ones I've experienced. First, unexpected power down. On one occasion during a shoot when the battery was around 20%, the camera powered down unexpectedly. The camera was idle, so no shots were ruined. I swapped in a fresh battery and it never happened again. Was it concerning? Yes. Was it the end of the world? No. The second thing I encountered was a button freeze. On probably about five occasions over the course of three full shoot days, all the buttons on the camera became unresponsive. Again, this never happened while rolling, so no shots were ruined or drastically extended, but basically I'd go to hit record and nothing would happen. I'd hit menu or play and nothing would happen. The only way to fix it was to power the camera down and back up. Doing this always fixed the issue and the freezes never happened back to back. It was always at least a few hours between them. I'm sure this will be fixed in an upcoming firmware update. Lastly, the issue of dropped or damaged frames. This has only happened to me once, but it's the worst offender. I was reviewing some footage from a two day shoot and I noticed a frame with a glitch. I'm gonna show it right now. I'm not sure if it's technically a dropped frame or if it's something else, but it had the potential to ruin this take. My only recourse is to duplicate or cut out the damaged frame. Blackmagic has got to fix this as soon as possible. Some other obligatory complaints that others have already mentioned. The only power button and menu button on the camera are inside the onboard touchscreen. It's awkward to open that thing up, especially when it's on your shoulder and your face is blocking it. Also, there's no HDMI out, though I rarely use HDMI only monitors. And there's some fan noise. It's louder when the camera's working harder, but it hasn't been bad enough to hurt any of my footage. 
Hands down, everyone's biggest complaint about this camera is its lack of light sensitivity, and I agree. Not only is this not a low light camera, it's not suitable for many indoor unlit situations. So if low light is important to you, forget the Ursa Mini 4K. This camera has three ISO options, 200, 400, and 800, and its native ISO is 400. At ISO 400, any indoor shooting, even with CFL or LED production lights, is challenging. I rarely want to slow the shutter speed below 180 degrees, but even with a really fast lens fairly open, say at f1.8, it can be a challenge to get proper exposure. Many people only have f2.8 lenses, which are even harder to use. The result indoors is that lenses are often wide open and higher shutter speeds are impossible. This limits your options when you encounter curveballs like flickering LCD screens or the need for less shallow depth of field. One such situation I encountered was shooting on a green psych wall. Budget was limited, so we couldn't blast the stage with lights. I wanted more depth of field to keep the subject in focus, and I wanted a higher shutter speed to minimize motion blur and allow for a cleaner key. But I ended up stuck at 150 degree shutter angle and I had to open up to f2.0, which wasn't ideal. ISO 800 is just awful. It is so riddled with noise, I can only imagine wanting to use it in a situation where what's happening in a scene is so spur of the moment that capturing it trumps quality. Additionally, I have only encountered the dreaded fixed pattern noise issue at ISO 800. Thus, I have trained myself to ignore the ISO 800 option altogether. The most encouraging thing about the Ursa Mini 4.6K is that it has a completely new sensor. The native ISO is 800 and that it can go up to ISO 1600. Initial sample footage looks gorgeous, particularly in RAW, but I'm curious to see if there's much noise at ISO 1600 and lower ProRes flavors. We'll see if Blackmagic can improve the ISO 800 footage on the 4K camera. They did manage to address fixed pattern noise in the production camera with a firmware update. Personally, I love that Blackmagic gives consumers the option of what power solution to use, V-mount or gold mount. This means we benefit from market competition on battery performance and price, and we can use the same batteries with a variety of existing and future production products, unlike a lot of Canon and Sony batteries. All the research I've done seems to show that V-mount is more popular among consumers, but the gold mount is a stronger mechanism that lasts longer and isn't prone to disconnecting accidentally. So, for this camera, I got the Anton Bauer Digital 90 Gold mount battery kit. I've been very happy with these batteries and I'm even more pleased with the charger. It has a built-in carrying handle, a color LCD display, and it can charge two batteries simultaneously from 0 to 100% in under 90 minutes. In terms of battery life, these digital 90 batteries last about 3 to 4 hours each with the camera and the EVF going, which is excellent. My only complaint is that the Ursa Mini 4K shipped with only half the charging cable in the box. I'm not sure if this was an assembly line error or a penny-pinching business decision, but it sucks to have to separately buy such a core component like a power cord, even if it is inexpensive. Some quick discussion of the touchscreen and the EVF. People have been heaping praise onto the external EVF, and I agree that it's fantastic, but I also haven't used many others for comparison. One option that would be nice would be the ability to apply the in-camera LUT to this EVF, just as you can with the onboard touchscreen. Currently, you're stuck with just the flat profile on the EVF. The Ursa Mini's touchscreen is a mixed bag. While it is relatively large and bright and has some solid display options, it definitely could be improved. First, it only has 180 degrees of rotation from straight up to back facing to straight down. Ideally, it could flip around to forward facing for situations where you're a one-person crew and you need to see your shot while you're adjusting lights. Another thing, in my opinion, when you're in video mode, this touchscreen always looks very yellowish green. It's probably just the settings of this in-camera LUT, but it's bad. This display also looks a couple stops overexposed when you're in video mode. When I'm on a tripod, I like to use both viewfinders. EVF for exposure and focus, touchscreen for composition, white balance, and color. It'd be nice to be able to trust both monitors. The biggest story in the Ursa Mini's workflow is the CFast 2.0 cards. These are definitely expensive, however they are competitive with Sony's XQD cards and they're coming down in price gradually. When you consider that they're currently able to go up to 256 gigs and you're able to write 60 frames per second uncompressed raw to them internally, it's amazing how small they are. As I mentioned in the codec section, I love being able to shoot multiple flavors of ProRes on this camera. Having QuickTime files available at the top level in the finder, ready to copy for editing, 
is worlds better than using Sony's .mts files or Canon's private file directory. I simply copy the files off the card onto my drive, I import them to Premiere and I start editing. Compare that to Canon where you can't even look at the files in the finder, you have to go into Premiere to even see the video files within the container. As I mentioned above, I apply Captain Hook's LUT and then any other color correction once I'm in Premiere. The workflow for RAW, which is just folders of DNG image sequences, is more complicated and it's best handled with DaVinci Resolve Studio. This is a great free bonus with the purchase of any Blackmagic camera. Now since I like editing in Premiere though, the few times I have shot RAW, I've just used Resolve to transcode the DNGs to ProRes 4444 QuickTimes, then I import those QuickTimes into Premiere. And lastly, audio. I have audio at the bottom of this review because I don't think it's critical to a great video camera. If you're capturing multiple sources or need top-notch sound quality, just hire a sound person with a separate recorder. The big news for the Ursa Mini over the production camera is the addition of native XLR inputs and phantom power. The good news? You can now easily, without needing adapters, run a shotgun mic and a wireless lav mic into the camera. The bad news? The XLR ports are a little sticky and they're hard to pull the cords out of. Though not as bad as this one YouTube video I've seen where the guy does it for like 20 seconds, which is ridiculous. He's exaggerating. Phantom power appears to generate more hiss than it should, and the preamps in this camera do seem a bit underpowered. I haven't used the onboard mic much, and when I do, I use it for scratch track. I've seen reports of it having a very noisy signal, but I can't confirm, and I don't really care since it's just for scratch audio anyway. I have noticed some audio noise when using the XLR ports, and I've gotten the best results with the following settings. For my Sennheiser MKE 600 shotgun mic, I use a AA battery in the mic, I set the Ursa Mini Phantom Power to off, and I set the Ursa Mini Audio Menu to Mic High. I also have the mic fairly close to my subject. For my Sennheiser G3 Lav Mics, I set the Ursa Mini Audio Menu to Mic High. I set Ursa Mini Phantom Power to off. I set the G3 Transmitter and the Receiver both to minus 18 decibels. And I set Pitch Tone to Active and Squelch to Low. Using these settings, I've gotten great audio results on this camera. My only complaint is that the physical audio dials don't have a hard stop, and the audio gain isn't displayed on either viewfinder. The dials just spin infinitely in both directions. That, combined with needing to go into the menu to set your gain level, makes quick audio adjustments very difficult. The quick fix here is for Blackmagic to add the audio level percentage somewhere on the display overlays. All right, guys, that's the end of this review. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to check out my unboxing if you haven't seen it yet. Subscribe on YouTube or follow on Vimeo, and I'll see you on the next one.